Welcome back to another episode of Old History. As you may have noticed, the name of this channel, as well as the Facebook page, is now called the Old History Project. This change was made to make it easier for people to find my content if they are not subscribed. Speaking of, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and hit the notification bell. It's free, and you can always undo this later. Before we begin, I'd firstly like to thank the participants of the poll I created in the community section of the YouTube channel for suggesting this video. Firstly, secondly, I'd like, I'd like to say that I do have a Patreon set up where you can support this channel to ensure that I keep bringing you top-notch content on all forms of my media. You can find the link in the description of this video. Firstly, thirdly, please go and give my good friend Jason at the Beard Guy and Friends Co. a look-see for all your beardly needs. Now this is also going to be a viewer beware. Some of the things mentioned in this video might not be suitable for the ears of young historians. So as we all may or may not have learned at some point or another, in times past, the United States had insane asylums. But the United States did not start that tradition. Insane asylums, or crazy houses, goes all the way back to early medieval Europe, with cases of treatment going back further than that. One such building is called the Narenturma, which is the German word for fool's towers. It was built in 1784 when Holy Roman Emperor uh, Joseph I was uh, in office. You also have Bethlehem Royal Hospital, notoriously known as Bedlam. It was established as a priory in 1247 when Henry III was king. It is thought to have began care for the insane in 1377. The history of treatment for the mentally handicapped goes all the way back for centuries. But back to the topic, Insane Asylum of Tennessee. Now to just start off this list, the first asylum built in the state was the Tennessee Lunatic Asylum. It was established by legislature in uh, 1832 and opened in Nashville in 1840. It was located at 12th Avenue South and Division Street. The thought behind building this asylum arose out of the greater context of what was then known as the Asylum Movement which was largely built upon the theories of a group of European physicians. The base of this system was centered around a theory that lunacy, or insanity, came from a disordered environment and involved removing patients from their harmful surroundings and placing them in a controlled setting, with the hopes that they could develop habits and healthy modes of thought. Just five years after the opening of this asylum, a book titled A Secret Worth Knowing was written supposedly by an asylum patient under the name Green Grimes and it appeared to be praising the asylum's success. But despite this book, uh, the institution quickly faced a set of interlocking problems. The legislature had been quite generous with its budgetary appropriations, at least as measured by the total size of the state budget. For most years during the antebellum era, before the Civil War, asylum appropriations far exceeded those for the state penitentiary, which was the other public institution founded during this era of reform. And in fact, the asylum budget often even surpassed that of the entire executive payroll, but the money would never be enough. The asylum would lurch along absurdly over budget and understaffed, sometimes by as much as 200%. But it wouldn't be until a visit by Dorothy Dix, who was an advocate for the care of uh, the mentally handicapped, that she deemed the current asylum unfit, overpopulated, and far over budget. She, along with the pleas of staff, urged the legislator to approve the construction of another facility. It would undergo several name changes, but most of us have probably heard it called the Mental Tennessee Mental Health Institute, which is located along Murfreesboro Pike, just outside of Nashville. It was built in 1857 and operated until 1995 when the hospital moved to a new location. The original buildings were demolished soon thereafter. Another one to mention, and this one's kind of important, would be the East Tennessee Hospital for the Insane aka Lakeshore Mental Health Institute. It opened in 1886 with just 99 patients that were transferred from the lunatic asylum in Nashville. The opening of this asylum was plagued with funding stops and political infighting. Although it would change names to Eastern State Hospital in 1927 and again to Lakeshore Mental Health Institute by the 1970s. A few people still refer to it as Eastern State. Its history is filled with scandals, stories of abuse, and inhumane conditions. There are also plenty of stories of sadistic workers beating patients that goes well into the 1970s. The prison system originally ran state hospitals that treated mental illness, 
up until the establishment of the State Department of Mental Health in the 1950s. Lakeshore uh, was fenced, guarded, and many patients were caged, restrained. When the midnight raid of 1971 happened, State Representative Richard Krieg uncovered the horrible conditions there, and it's something that you'd see out of like a Wes Craven horror film or something. Because bed for, beds for the elderly spilled into dark and unlit hallways. Large rooms were so crowded that all of the beds touched each other. Large water leaks and rusted out pipes created a damp environment, and there were roaches and bugs everywhere. The hospital wings were also deemed as extreme fire hazards. Now, Lakeshore would run all the way up until 2012 when it was officially closed, and today only one building remains standing. Although I do recall in the news somebody actually went inside one of the buildings and found all kinds of patient records, social security numbers and stuff. I would assume this happened after Lakeshore closed. Uh, a common, you better straighten your ass up story when I was in school was that if you don't start acting upright, I'm going to send you to Lakeshore. Stories that it was basically hell on earth were rampant among school age kids, not knowing what it actually was, nor what happened there. The next place to mention would be the Western Hospital for the Insane in Bolivar, Tennessee. Its history stems back to 1873, when the General Assembly of the state suddenly realized that they needed another hospital for the mentally ill. The state would purchase nearly 1,200 acres from, of a former plantation owned by General Calvin Jones. It would be officially opened in eight, uh, November 1889 with 156 patients transferred from the Nashville Asylum. It would grow to house over 2,300 patients by the 1960s. And, in repeating fashion, this hospital was severely overcrowded with not enough doctors and staff to treat all of the patients that they have. Patients would become warehoused for decades. And people would be fortunate just to see a psych for 10 minutes a week. The system for securing financial care for patients was extremely flawed and the state agencies agreed to pay for one patient per thousand. Because of this, the hospital had to engage in deficit spending just to keep itself afloat. Now, one important story here is that the hospital once had a quote-unquote tight connection with uh, Georgia Tan, who operated the Tennessee Children's Home Society, which was an adoption agency in Memphis. Tan used the unlicensed orphanage as a front for her black market baby adoption scheme. Children born to patients at the asylum would be placed for adoption with a false background for as little as seven dollars. Many children would be sold to pedophiles or for slave labor. Over the course of 30 years, as many as 5,000 families would be displaced due to Tan's adoption practices. This would be backed by sick and demented local judges and politicians. Tan would make her millions from the 1920s to 1949. Children at the orphanage would be starved, beaten, and molested, and during four months in 1945, 50 children died while in her care, prompting an investigation by authorities. It would not be until after her death in 1950 due to cancer did the real story come to light. Past this point, viewer discretion is advised. For the remainder of the video, you will no longer see pictures of asylums in Tennessee. I ran out of pictures. You will instead see pictures of asylums from around the nation. They should be labeled. We will also be discussing some of the early medical treatments that took place at some of these asylums. Now this happened not just in Tennessee, but everywhere at every mental health institution. Now there are more horrible treatments that I won't discuss, but we'll just talk about some of the basic stuff. One treatment included insulin shock therapy, which was the brainchild of Manfred Sacco, who was a German neurologist. And his thought was that the injection of a sufficiently large dose of insulin drastically lowered the sugar content of the blood and induced a hypoglycemic state. Basically, they would put them in a coma, a deep coma, which could only be relieved by injection of sugar or administering of sugar. As a diabetic, that is very horrible. If you've ever had low blood sugar, it feels terrible. This process would be repeated daily for months at a time with doctors administering as many as 50 to 60 treatments per patient. That's a pretty horrible thing. In earlier times, it was thought that demonic possession cured insanity. They would exercise demons. They would exercise the mental illness right out of the patients. Benjamin Rush, who was the so-called father of American psychiatry, would purge, blister, vomit, and bleed his patients, sometimes to death, in an attempt to cure them as he thought that bodily fluids created an imbalance in the brain. This obviously didn't work. Henry Cotton, the superintendent at Trenton State Hospital in New Jersey, thought that infected parts of the body would lead to madness. He began pulling rotten teeth 
and when that clearly didn't work, he evolved to removing tonsils, thinking that saliva was infecting the brain. He would remove stomachs, intestines, gallbladders. And in a shock, this didn't work either, and carried a very high mortality rate. The next very questionable ther uh, therapy was called metrazole th uh, shock therapy, like insulin. This worked on the mistaken theory that epilepsy and schizophrenia couldn't exist at the same time. Now the key? Seizures. Laszlo von Meduna, who was a Hungarian physician, discovered that the drug metrazole could produce a seizure-like convulsion in patients, therefore shocking their brains out of mental illness. It proved to be a shock physically as well because some patients had x-rays and it was actually damaging the uh, vertebrae in their back, sometimes even breaking it. The other thing to discuss would be a lobotomy, and I'm pretty sure just about everybody here has heard of a lobotomy. The thought behind this would be sticking a needle through the eye or up, up your nose and uh, severing neural connections in some of the uh, frontal cortexes in your brain. Clearly this made zombies out of people and didn't work either. So there are more treatments that occur, as I stated, and there are a few more mental health asylums, but we'll stop the video here because I just don't think I want to make a mini documentary yet. Also, if you've made it this far, please keep an eye on the Facebook page. I have a very important announcement coming up for the fall. It's something uh, that I think everybody will enjoy. Uh, it does involve the Pressman's home and it involves uh, a state society. Not going to spoil anything, but uh, you guys are going to love it. Be in for a shock. Well, thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to this video and tell me what you think in the comments below, as this is not a normal video for old history. But it is history of the state, and some people have close ties to uh, some of these asylums. You know, maybe they had a loved one that went there, you know, and maybe they just wanted to know some of the history around it. So, if you're one of those people, please comment and tell me your story in the comments below. Thanks for watching.